Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Dennis Reardon, president of Monongatuck Audubon Society. Welcome to this evening's meeting. I want to start with an acknowledgement that Nunkatuck chapter area is on the land native to Pogusset, Wepawag, Quinnipiac, Tatakit, Monongatuck, and Hamanasset people. And we honor them for their contributions through thousands of years before European colonization. Our next Zoom meeting will be a week from this evening with Audubon, Connecticut's Director of Bird Conservation, Corey Folsom O'Keefe. She'll be sharing her knowledge about our beach nesting birds and tips for visiting the beach during the summer without causing unnecessary disturbance to the birds. Let's share the shore. This presentation is being recorded. And I'd like to welcome uh, Sue Schubel. Sue is with Audubon Seabird Institute in Maine, known as Seabird Sue. She works on Maine's offshore islands with puffins, mirrors, guillemots, and other nesting seabirds. She also works on Audubon's decoys and makes solar powered playback devices two of which we bought from her and have used uh, successfully to attract purple martins to uh, create new colonies. Among visitors to Hog Island's, Audubon's Hog Island camps, Sue is perhaps best known for her puffing cream puffs. And with that, I welcome Sue. Uh, you can share your <laughs> screen. Okay, thank you. And uh, if everyone else would mute yourselves, thank you. That's the one I need. There we go. I don't think that did that come up. Am I sharing the right thing? You're sure. <laughs> there we go. Yep. Perfect. <laughs> okay. <good. laughs> you never know. <laughs> okay. Great. Thanks, Dennis. And um, I didn't put the Purple Martins in here tonight, but I would like to get the latest update on how they're doing. <clears throat> um, I am with the Seabird Institute based here in Bremen, Maine. And we are, and I'm coming to you. This is our uh, shop. Um, we're based here right at the uh, mainland off Hog Island. So if you're attracted to Hog Island by my cream puffin decoys, you'll pass right by our decoy shop. We've recently uh, turned the back office into my painting studio. So that's quite nice. Um, Talking about decoys though, you know, people have used decoys for a long time and mainly they've used them to trick those birds into coming close so that they can shoot them. We have a bit of a different strategy here. Our main focus is to lure birds in. We want to communicate with those birds to provide them with safe places to go. So we're in the business of conservation decoys here. <clears throat> We acquired the Mad River Decoy Company, which was started in Vermont. When it was time for them to retire, they came to us and asked if we'd like to take over. They started that in 1990 and got a lot of business. So the thing started, uh, oh, we transferred it here in, 19, in uh, 2016 and in the winter, we drove through a snowstorm with a horse trailer full of gear and set it up in our barn. 
Here's some folks working in that shop. So I wanted to take you through the process of how these decoys are made. Um, <clears throat> we actually haven't made any molds ourselves yet. We're just using molds still from Jim and Nancy Henry. It's a pretty complicated process and we have enough molds to keep us going for now. But you start with a wooden master, the exact size of the decoy that you want. <clears throat> it was hand, uh, Jim hand carved these, covered them with mold release, and then he would make a two piece mold on each one out of high temperature epoxy. This is a close up of the little puffin decoy mold that we have. Uh, you can't really tell if you took those springs off, the thing splits in half, the mold splits in half so that each side of the bird is exactly the same. When you're making a mold like this, uh, you don't want to have very many, well, you really want no undercuts. So it has to be kind of a smooth, simple shaped bird. Uh, the decoy molds get attached to this mandrel, you can see it in the right hand picture. It's a piece of metal and so you can balance out the load. That whole mandrel is going to turn in multiple directions. These decoys are rotomolded plastic. So they need to keep turning as the oven is heated. The left side, you can see the picture of our oven. <clears throat> um, as the plastic is heated, it coats the inside of that mold so that when it's done, after you bake it for 25 minutes and cool it, you can pop it open. Here's Eric cooling some decoys. You can see he popped that decoy mold open in half and then you get a nice hollow, lightweight, waterproof decoy. So they're very functional. I mean, I've used a lot of wooden decoys in my day and they're great too, but they're not as lightweight and they tend to crack over time. So these are really good for being in the field, especially when you're in a really remote location where you have to carry them or throw them up on a, onto a rough little island. <clears throat> Some of our decoys are actually solid. The little ones, the least turn size birds, those are solid injection molded and we have those made and sent to us. The next step after you have your shaped bird is you gotta smooth off any seam irregularities, any rough spots, <clears throat> and then they get primed with oil-based primer. So we use house paints on these birds, nice exterior grade Ben Moore house paints. And uh, to make the primer stick, you do a quick flash over it with a torch, a propane torch, and then use this oil-based primer to coat them with. That allows the latex house paint to stick to the plastic. And then comes the part that I like, which is the painting. So Eric and Adrian are mainly in charge of creating the bodies of the birds, and then they hand them off to me after they're primed. It is really so much fun to look at a million reference pictures and agonize about the exact shade of color that these birds should be. And then even though the birds don't care <laughs> that much, um, I think that the people buying them do care. And it's really fascinating when you study them to find out what are the attributes that make it what it is. So those brown knotties, they're a little bit complicated and it was only until I realized that little black in front of their eye and the little white underneath and behind the eye, that was critical to them really looking like a brown knotty. So even though these birds aren't exactly the right shape as a real bird, the same shape, um, they are very, very effective. So the brown knotties have been a variation so each one is quite individual. The mer eggs, very individual. There are many, many shades of gray in this shop. We agonize over it all the time. Um, it's fun because there are so many gray birds in the seabird world, grays, blacks, whites, and then they tend to have a note of bright color on many of them. <clears throat> so I mix up a lot of grays. Grays are magical colors because depending on what they're next to and the lighting, they can change so much. So those little uh, blue-gray knotties up at the top, they, 
A, we're agonizing. They have a very smooth transition of plumage. So that took quite a while to make those. We sent a whole batch of them off to Palmyra Atoll, which was quite exciting. So though we have a, a limited number of molds, shapes, and sizes, we can make many species with those just by painting them differently, sometimes modifying the beaks a little bit. We have the capacity to make many decoys to attract many species, even Christmas turns. <clears throat> so little uh, Eastern Egg Rock is the island near here, right down the bay, nine miles down the bay where puffins are found. So if you come to Hog Island, you'll get a chance to go boat around Eastern Egg Rock and you'll see puffins and then you'll come back and eat cream puffins. This is a little bit pixelated, but this, this little island is really the reason why we're here making decoys for conservation. Like many of the 4,000 islands, or more than 4,000 islands off the coast of Maine, it was a really prosperous seabird colony back in the day. <clears throat> there were terns and gulls nesting on the ground. Sorry, I'm a little jokey. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, early European settlers would come to these islands to, to harvest the resources. So they would go out and collect eggs not only for their own food, but to sell at market in Portland and Boston. They, um, the people called eggers would go out and in order to make sure they had fresh eggs to sell, they would go one day and smash all the eggs on the island. And then the birds would naturally respond by relaying a few days later so that they could try to get in a, a nest cycle. Um, <clears throat> and then the eggers would come back and take those eggs. So it was very hard on the seabirds. Seabirds have pretty large eggs to the size of their bodies. And so they can't relay their eggs too many times without giving up on that. People would hunt the birds for meat, for lobster bait. It was very easy to catch them because you could lay nets over the rocks. And since the puffins nest underground, when they came out in the morning, they would get tangled up in those nets and could be easily caught. The most wasteful thing, I think, is that it became the fashion for women to wear feathers and whole birds on their heads, on their hats. Sorry. So they um, we go out and shoot birds, terns, gulls, really any kind of bird was fair game for, to put on a hat. And it was big business in, to su support yourself in the millinery trade. So as the result of all these activities, uh, m many of the seabird islands in Maine were decimated and there were no puffins left in Muscungus Bay. Supposedly only one pair of puffins left on one island, Matinicus Rock in the whole state. Uh, the terns were certainly much fewer. It was, it was a sad time. Now, when Steve Kress came, uh, to Maine. He was one of the instructors, bird life instructors at the Audubon camp on Hog Island. He thought, wouldn't it be great to get some more diversity back in this system? Because he knew the history of the area. Being a keen birder, he also knew the biology of puffins. And he thought, we could really uh, get these birds to come back to this island. Now, some things about the biology of puffins that was important for this project. Puffins, uh, they lay an egg, they incubate it underground for 40 days. Both parents take care of it. When that chick hatches, they take care of it by bringing it food for another 40 days or so. They just bring whole fish in and drop it down. No regurgitating necessary. And then when it's time to fledge, the little chick runs out to sea on its own at night and the parents don't go with it. So we thought, well, we could do that. No regurgitating, we don't have to go to sea. It was actually easier to raise puffin chicks than it is to raise a human kid. In the winter, off they go to sea. The little puffin chicks leave before the adults. So they're out there. We don't really know if they meet up with the adults later or not but everybody spends the winter at sea. The next spring, the adults will come back because they're in the, at the age to nest still, uh, but the chicks don't need to come back 
until they're four or five. That's when they're old enough to lay an egg. They could come back when they're two or three just to visit. Occasionally, you'll see a one-year-old. Puffins are really social. So Steve had this plan that he could get some puffin chicks from Newfoundland, not too young because they need to be at least three days old to keep themselves warm and not too old because you don't want them learning that Canada is their homeland. Puffins are really tightly tied to their natal site. So they almost always come back to the island that they fledged from. So he got 10 day old chicks and they were raised up on Eastern Egg Rock. <clears throat> they fledged. It was pretty easy to raise them to fledging. And then began the long wait. Now, if you were a puffin who loves a crowd, who nests with dozens or hundreds or thousands or even a million other puffins, it would be a little bleak to come back to Eastern Egg Rock and see no puffins there. Colonial seabirds really are, they benefit from being colonial. So they are really in this chaotic, loud, noisy, colorful environment full of birds. All those eyes looking out for predators, all those beaks really ready to help defend each other, and all those wings soaring over the wide sea so that they can find that patchy prey that might be near the island or it might not be. So being in a seabird colony certainly has advantages. Since we didn't have any puffins on egg rock at the time, those little pufflings were ready to come back. He thought, well, we better make some. So the first decoys were carved out of wood and they were set out on the rocks. And, you know, a puffin is not too dumb. It probably knew that was not a real bird, but it liked it. It looked like a puffin. It's very attractive. And it was a way to communicate with that bird that the same thing that a real puffin would have communicated, which is this island is safe. You might find a mate here. There's food nearby. So the puffins came, a couple of puffins came. After they played with the decoy, they saw other live puffins and they set up shop. Luckily, uh, when they were doing this experiment, they <clears throat> also wanted to attract terns. Puffins are hidden underground, so they're relatively safe when they're nesting, but they can be eaten, swallowed whole by a large gull. So Steve's theory was that if he also convinced terns to nest here, terns which nest on the open ground and are very aggressive about defending territory, they could chase away some of the predators. So he encouraged terns to nest here. And you can see he used some very simple looking decoys. Obviously, that doesn't look exactly like an Arctic tern, but close enough. So uh, this bird must have been keying in on basic color, basic shape, a little pointy beak. We have since uh, seen a tropic bird at Seal Island who was attracted to a lobster buoy with a little red stick at the back that looked like a red tail. So using really simplified decoys and some other decoys, you can see this one was particularly attractive because that bird is offering it a courtship fish. Um, a tern colony formed on this island also. Now we couldn't translocate tern chicks because the tern biology is different. Terns do raise their young and spend a lot of time with them. They don't regurgitate, we could have fed the chicks, but we could not migrate to Antarctica with them come fall. So parents and chicks of Arctic terns migrate together. <clears throat> so in, that, uh, in creating this social attraction technique that Steve did, he, uh, you know, as time progressed, he thought about more ways to enhance it. So we had decoys, and then what's the next thing that's in a big seabird colony? You got the color, you got the movement. So mirrors, providing mirrors like this could magnify the movement of the living birds that came by. So that was a good way to make a little additional boost. <clears throat> and then the audio, this bird is standing in front of a solar powered rechargeable sound system. And um, 
these are designed to play all season, 24 hours a day, if you want them to, and to attract birds. Generally, in a, in a bird colony, if it's quiet, that's a sign of alarm. Maybe a predator is coming by. Maybe the birds have left the island. So generally, we do play our sound attraction systems 24 hours a day. <clears throat> this is the Laysan albatross. We'll be back to them a little later. So the sound systems, I've made a lot of these. Uh, and they consist of a box that's big enough to fit either two batteries or a pug, and usually some a charge controller for the solar panel. And nowadays, an MP3 player, we used to use um, CD players. Uh, we put that on repeat play. There's an amplifier, all the various cords and adapters you need. And then the solar is the uh, important thing to keep it running. So we usually use two, either two 12 volt or two six volt batteries, unless you're right at the equator when you can get by with less, if you're in a very tropical sunny place. But we size the solar and the battery bank to the location and also set the angle of the solar panel specifically to wherever you happen to be. So we've created this whole system, the whole system of tools and uh, technique. And these are used for conservation. And within the conservation world, we mostly are in these categories. Restoration, in which we're returning birds to sites where they used to nest and for some reason they don't nest there anymore. Relocation, which is if you want the birds to move somewhere else, maybe there's some industry coming in or maybe their, new, their site is in, at risk. There's been an oil spill or something. <clears throat> Comfort and confidence, which is if uh, you're hand rearing some birds or maybe they're in rehab and they just need a friend and uh, research. So they can be used to help catch birds for doing a scientific study. And this map shows the locations of social attraction projects, seabird restoration projects uh, as of 2012. So it's increased since then. At that point, I think there were 140. Now there are 171 projects at least in 15 countries. So it's quite widespread. And I'll, I'll tell you about a few of them. Uh, so this is Devil Slide Rock, California. These mer decoys were sent out there. I worked on this project actually. And the island, this is a restoration. So because um, there was an oil spill and there was also a lot of gill netting and basically the whole colony was eliminated. But it hadn't been eliminated long. It was within the possible living memory of some MERS. So it was 10 years of absence. But luckily there was funding to go in and try to mitigate this, these problems before the, all those birds died off. I mean, potentially there were birds that had bred there and just been scared away by the poor conditions, but would potentially breed again if we communicated to them that it was a safe place. Yeah, there's a picture of Devil's Slide Rock. You can see the landings are beautiful. Uh, it was a pretty treacherous place to get onto and a place where if you had wooden decoys, it would have been even harder to get everything ashore because the plastic ones were nice and light. We have mirror boxes up there, which were immediately covered in guano. So they, didn't really provide a lot of reflection, but they did provide nice little shelters. And MERS tend to like to belly up to kind of a, a little um, protective ledge. So <clears throat> we went out there in 96, climbed up on that rock with climbing ropes, lugged all those things up there. And you can see that uh, there was a picture from 1979 where that rock was covered with MERS. All those little specks are MERS. And now it has been restored to that former glory. The first year that we put this stuff out, in fact, the very next day after we put the equipment out and had the sounds on, we were watching from the mainland. You can, it's, it's quite close to shore. You can watch with a telescope. 
And we saw MERS land. We saw one land on one side. We saw one land on the other side. They ran together. It was a joyous moment. And they laid eggs that first year. So it was really exciting because most of these projects take a pretty long time. A lot of these birds don't mature until they're four, five, six years old. And um, so if you start putting an idea in their head when they're very young, it still takes some time. We also used myrrh decoys on Matinicus rock for many years, put them out every year. The closest MERS, there was a record of MERS on Matinicus rock from an egg in a museum collection but it had been more than a hundred years since they had nested there. And um, so we put out the decoys and the sounds and watched and watched. MERS came by a lot, especially early in the season when they were on their way back to Yellow Myrrh Ledge in Canada. But finally, just a couple of years ago, we have a small stable population now nesting under the rocks. In this site, they nest under the rocks, which is unusual, a little different than California but it is like uh, the way they behave at Yellow Mer Ledge and Machias Seal Island. <clears throat> so uh, these bridal terns and brown noddies, we made these in our shop and off they flew to Desisheo Island off Puerto Rico. This is a restored island, meaning they had to go in and take out all the introduced um, predators that were there. There were rats and goats, and it took quite a lot of time to restore that to a safe place. But now there are a number of groups working out there. Island Conservation, U.S. Fish, it's a um, national park. So all these groups have come together and they are encouraging the breeding of the bridal terns, the brown noddies, and the Audubon shearwaters. You can see the habitat here. Uh, these decoys, we had to, they glued them down to the rocks. Unfortunately, a big storm took most of them out the first year, but they got another batch. And actually there was, I think just one decoy left and yet it still attracted turns right to it. They nested right next to it. So they have a new set of decoys and they seem to be really doing well. Um, there was a sound system for the for the bridal turns and then one up in the hills for the Audubon shearwaters, which of course are nocturnal prosolarians. And so there wasn't a lot of point of making decoys for them, although we're in discussion with different groups now wondering if it, on nights when there is a bit of moon, if it would be worthwhile to do some shearwaters. For the nocturnal birds like those and storm petrels, Sometimes there's been experimentation providing scent because those birds are quite motivated by scent. To, that's the way they find their burrows. And so if you can provide scent from some storm petrels, that could also be attractive. Here are some Chinese crested terns and some greater crested terns. This was one of our early big projects. Um, the Chinese crested tern is highly endangered. They were down to just like 20 individuals that were known about it. Prior to that, uh, they were thought to be extinct. So this was very exciting one. Just a handful were found off the coast of China. <clears throat> These decoys and sound systems went to uh, Taedundao Island. <laughs> I can't remember that one. Um, and and it was quite amazing that um, they had decoys for the greater crested and the Chinese crested terns. They tend to nest together in big flocks and both species were attracted to this island. In China still there seems to be a problem with illegal egg harvesting which was what really wiped them out. They had not nested on Taedundao Island before but they had nested on an island nearby that. So the group that was the, on the the other island where there was the illegal egg harvesting moved over to this island and um, they were successful. In the first year they had, had one fledging, they had 19 adults which was more than had been seen before and then the year after that 43 adults 
and uh, the numbers keep going up. Now there's some concern that they, I mean, the benefit of luring them into a place was so that they could really find a mate when there were so few mates around. Uh, now they're a little bit worried that they're grouping them up, all the eggs in one basket, so to speak. And they would like it if they were at least in a couple of locations, if those locations can be effectively protected. We sent uh, most of our decoys to South Korea, where there's another island chain where some birds have been seen. Here's some common terns. We make a lot of common terns. So the mold that we have for common terns is kind of the mid-sized tern mold that we use for a lot of our terns. But uh, to make the common terns, well, these need their black beak tips and their shiny eyes, but they were almost ready to go. And then we had uh, some lease terns, a lot of lease terns too. Uh, with the least turns, you can make black turns, blue gray noddies, any kind of small turn. Least turns all over, you know, they struggle. They nest on mainland beaches where they're susceptible to human traffic, pets, mammals, owls, you know, everything will eat a least turn. Cars drive on them. They're very, uh, nestled right into the sand, so they're very vulnerable. We've used least turn decoys to lure these birds to Stratton Island, which is an island we manage in southern Maine, thinking that they would be more protected from at least the mainland predators out there. So uh, we've also sent least turn decoys to California, southern and northern California, <coughs> Florida, Louisiana, Mississippi. There, there are a lot of projects for least turns. The goal mainly is to, to lure them into an area where you can protect them a little bit better, fenced off from larger mammals uh, and from dogs and cars, basically. So this is a uh, relocation project in Curaçao, which is an island in the Dutch Antilles. And uh, I don't think they, well, yeah, the decoys are in there. So this project just came about. There's gonna be a wind power project put on Curacao right on the beach where the birds usually nest. So based on the whim of people, these birds have to move. But by assisting them to help them find a new spot where they'll have a little bit of advantage from predator-proof fencing, <clears throat> uh, these guys did set up sound system and decoys. They were complicated a bit because the, the equipment arrived to them like the day after they were shut down for COVID and not allowed to leave their houses. <laughs> so they were they got slowed down a bit, but then somehow they got permission to get out there. And hopefully these birds will move to this location because they are gonna build this wind farm. Oh, they're so cute. <laughs> so double crested cormorants, um, we have sent a number of cormorant decoys around for educational purposes. Back when Mad River Decoy was in Vermont, they sent a lot of them to the Columbia River Estuary, which is an area, a large estuary. The Columbia River comes into it. This is a place with a lot of dispute between birds and people. People dredge that river so that the ships can come in and out. They make these dredge spoil islands that are perfect for birds. The largest double-crested cormorant colonies are there. The largest Caspian tern colonies are there. They have all these dams on the river. They have all these salmon fry that they're moving around the dams and putting in the estuary, which the birds think is great because it's perfect food for them. So there's a lot of conflict between the humans. There are a lot of Native American tribes that rely on that fish. And then of course the birds are pretty happy. It's It was found through studies uh, at OSU that the birds further down the estuary toward the sea had a more diverse diet than the birds further up the river. So the goal was to try to shift some of those birds from the islands higher up down to the mouth of the estuary where they could eat a more diverse diet. And 
fewer of those salmon fry. Ah, on to the lace and albatross. Now there's bird who knows how to party. Um, so obviously these decoys are to attract the birds and the lace and albatrosses, we sent a number of those to Hawaii. There's a project on Molokai where they've protected a section. Uh, it's a relatively small island and there's a large land trust there. Uh, lace and albatross nest even in backyards in some places. So having a nice safe place where they can base, at least fence them off from wandering dogs is pretty important. So they've got sound systems and decoys on this area, which is nicely protected. The island is much less peopled than some of the other islands. On Kauai, it's a very peopled island, and you can have an albatross in your backyard. Would that not be an excellent backyard bird? <laughs> so these guys nest in Princeville, which is just like a town of backyards, and they're often subject to dog attacks and injury by cars. Um, so there are certain people though, private homes who have safe places where they can nest. And there's a network that's setting up some social attraction systems there. They also move eggs from the runway where they are in conflict with the Navy, either to some, uh, they re them with infertile birds at some of these sites or another site uh, on Oahu. I really like the Hermans gulls. I think they are one of the most beautiful gulls. <clears throat> There's a really neat little project in Seaside, California with Monterey Audubon. Uh, you can see this area has a lot of human activity and uh, some of the Hermans nest on rooftops, but they set up this little tiny raft in that lake, which is in a great location. It's in the lake, so it's protected from a lot of predators. It's close to the sea so the birds can get food easily. They made this nice little float fenced around the edge so the fledglings wouldn't fall off. <clears throat> they set up a sound system in our decoys. Uh, they have a lot of partners with this and they um, monitor using cellular linked trail cams. So they can really keep track of what's going on on this island. There's a brewery that sells Gull, uh, Hermann's Gull beer there. You can go and uh, they have one of our decoys on the shelf. I'd recommend going there to toast those birds with next time you're in Seaside. So here's a nice medley of birds that flew off to Bermuda. Uh, in Bermuda Audubon Society has been working on a project there aren't really that many terns nesting in Bermuda, but they are very hopeful. <laughs> they, uh, on Southampton Island, they're trying to encourage the sooty terns. And then they have a couple of other ones, Pearl Island and Lambda Island, where uh, roseate and common tern decoys are put out. The common terns are more of a temperate bird, you know, so this is kind of pushing their limits. They're not quite as hurricane tolerant as the roseates, but of course, the roseates are endangered throughout their range, um, but they have been getting some response to the decoys in the sound systems. They have very few birds really to work with, so uh, they're, they're hopeful. One of the problems that they hadn't really thought about until they were getting some to nest on, I think it was Pearl Island, was that um, the ruddy turnstones do sometimes predate turn eggs. And the ruddy turnstones have been encouraged to overwinter in Bermuda more and more because they are just like pigeons eating street handouts in, in the towns of Bermuda. So they might be disruptive to the colony formation here. But also in Bermuda, I've taken sound systems down to Nunsuch Island and some of the <clears throat> little islets off there where the Bermuda petrels nest. Now, these islands are really crumbly limestone and the birds, some of the birds nest pretty low down on them. So the idea is that they won't be safe from climate change and sea level rise. So 
uh, Jeremy Medeiros is in charge of this project and he wanted to encourage them to nest higher up on the islets and then also on the Nunsuch itself after that island was restored. Um, that island's a bit higher and vegetated, so it is more protected from sea level rise. And the Bermuda petrels are nocturnal, so they didn't have any decoys. Also, the Peruvian diving petrels is a nocturnal species. We sent some sound systems down to Isla Chanarel in Chile, where the birds had been extirpated, but the island was restored by island conservation. They've got these sound systems. <laughs> After she ordered them, she said, well, I thought she ordered one. She said, you're going to kill me. I need two. <laughs> and then she said, and there's this rodent that, no, a marsupial that gnaws the wires. So there can't be any wires exposed. So <laughs> that was a little tricky. But they um, managed to set this up. Uh, on the neighboring island, which they were also working on, the rabbits have taken over the burrows where these nocturnal birds live. So this island does not have the rabbits. I think they eliminated the rabbits and they made artificial starts of burrows and then they put up the speakers and they found that the birds came right to the speakers. When the birds are attracted to the sound, they don't seem to be bothered by the volume. They like to be as close as possible. You'll see them on top of the speakers, right next to the speakers, nesting right there with it blasting in their ears. Now this, uh, the Hermon skulls and the gannet decoys, I think are my favorites. These babies went off to New Zealand. These are Australasian gannets. And they were purchased by uh, this wildlife trust, this conservation trust on the Tutukaka coast. Um, they are doing a lot of different projects. They're importing some kiwis to their property. And then they started this albatross project because they're near some other colonies and they are protecting this area and restoring the vegetation. So they have a website and a camera. You can get updates on their um, on their project. They did have landings and visitation, but so far no one has nested there yet. Common terns, black skimmers, and gull-billed terns were flying off to the Hampton Road Bridge Tunnel Project. So here's another conflict between humans and birds. That little island that you see kind of in the middle of that lower picture that is the uh, place where the tunnel is going under the water to connect these two roads. Well, they need to expand the bridge or the tunnel or something. So they've been paving over that whole little islet, which previously was excellent bird habitat. <clears throat> the little island that's a kind of on a spur off of it is called Fort Wool. And um, they were able to get permission to try to enhance the habitat on Fort Wool so that the birds that normally had nested on this bridge road tunnel thing uh, could move over there. Since the Fort Wool Island is smaller, they also brought in um, barges to act as nesting rafts. Now, part of the thing was they were trying to make this habitat as appealing as possible, but birds are a little habitual. So they knew that those birds would try to nest on that island that it was getting paved over. So they had this pup patrol. These dogs would run around and dissuade the birds from the place they wanted them to move from. And then the sounds and the decoys would pull them over and help them stick to the Fort Wool area. And the birds really did move over there. That was just this summer's project, or last summer, last summer's project. Uh, it was COVID summer number one, and there, so there was a lot of complications with logistics, but they did manage to get the equipment in place just in time, and they had the dogs out there. One of the dogs was pregnant, and she gave birth on the job, <laughs> but they were champs. Now, this is a, another cool project with common terns. Common terns get a lot of action. In uh, Switzerland, there's very little habitat left for nesting birds. And so a lot of them 
nests on rooftops of near buildings near lakes. You can see that green rooftop that's, that's the top of a boathouse where they've planted natural vegetation and put in sound systems and decoys and the terns nest right on that. Oh, let's see, what, how are we doing for time? We got a little time. Um, common terns we also sent to the Netherlands. So you see, we have quite worldwide reach with these decoys. And I wanted to show you this little video if it will work. This is a habitat that they were constructing in the Netherlands, a very watery country for the common terns there. Can you see that screen come up? Okay. Yes. I thought that was just uh, so neat and how great to have all that heavy equipment that you could do that with. <laughs> Sadly, they did at that point, so they didn't make the movie, but um, <clears throat> hopefully they were successful. Black-footed albatross. Now this is a bird that uh, has been used for attraction to certain, to safe sites, but also it's been used as a comfort and confidence decoy. So they're hand rearing a number of these albatross on uh, the North Shore of Oahu. And they ordered a bunch of decoys just so that these birds could see bird looking shapes instead of only humans taking care of them. And they seem to be very comforted by these decoys and they'll nuzzle, nuzzle right to them and sleep. So that's kind of sweet. A project that we're doing in Maine, which I consider kind of a research project, is about laughing gulls. Now, laughing gulls are often in conflict with terns. They're really spreading up the coast. So we have a lot of them on Eastern Egg Rock. We would love it if they would move to Western Egg Rock. So we put out some sound equipment there and some decoys. Um, and one of the questions that I often get with the sound systems is, does it matter if you use the calls that are specific to the location that you are working in? Do they only like their own accents, basically? So we got two soundtracks and we set up two decoy groupings on Western Egg Rock. One soundtrack is from Pacific Birds from Mexico, and one soundtrack is from Eastern Birds in the Atlantic. And uh, we have some. Um, <coughs> cellular linked cameras so that we can see who's in the decoys and whether one is more going to be more popular. Right now we haven't seen the laughing gulls in the decoy. We did just put out recently we have seen some herring gulls in there and a goose <laughs> and the goose 
I believe it was in the Virginia section, not the Mexico one. <laughs> so another sort of research project, experimental project was using these parasitators, which were modified um, small gull decoys actually. And they were modified so they could float also. They were trying to catch black capped petrels to put tags on them, mon um, migratory studying tags. I guess they were GPS tags or maybe satellite. Anyway, they, want, they had heard that, they knew that sometimes black capped petrels will mob Jaegers. So they thought if they were having a hard time catching them, they could put the Jaegers out on the water, the kept petrels would come by and they could capture them. It turned out that they weren't that hard to catch on the water, so they didn't really use our Jaegers, but I thought it was a cool idea. And it was fun to practice making them able to float properly. The oyster catchers, oyster catchers are not colonial seabirds and they're pretty aggressive to each other. They're very territorial. So the uses for these decoys are mostly if you want to catch one, to tag, to band it, or if you need to catch it for some other reason, uh, there was a bird that had a band that slipped over its foot that um, out in California, they called us up and said, quick, quick, we need a, we need a decoy because we have to catch this bird so we could help it, help the band um, not harm its foot. So they were able to lure it in to a noose mat with a decoy since they're so territorial and they took its band off, replaced it and it was fine. So from here in the chaos of this little faux seabird colony, we're producing lots of decoys, hopefully making a difference for birds in the world. Uh, seabirds are the most endangered group of birds and they nest on tiny little islands that are susceptible to all sorts of problems. Um, so we're just doing the best we can to try to make a difference there. And uh, I would be happy to answer any questions if anyone has any. If you have a question, uh, please by all means uh, unmute yourself and uh, ask. This is Robin. I am with Monongatuck Audubon as well um, as the advocacy chair. And I'm wondering how many people work with you in the lab regularly? What's your what's your crew size? Uh, well, in the summer for research on the islands, this year we have about 20 going out and it's a little reduced from regular because it's a, our second COVID summer. Um, in, in the decoy shop, it's just me and Adrian or Eric doing the baking. Uh, occasionally, we have we have had some volunteers help during some of the steps. Uh, we have a one week on Hog Island called Coastal Bird Conservation. It's a work and learn session. It used to be through Road Scholar, but now it's just through Hog Island. <clears throat> and so, if you come to that session, you do have a chance to help work on decoys. Um, and uh, I think we have 10 full-time staff now at the Seabird Institute, and many of them are coming to be based in Maine. We still have a few outliers that are migrants. That's awesome. And do you all ever get to deliver personally the birds to some of the um, international locations that you've featured? I always offer. <laughs> I, I, have I have taken uh, the sound systems uh, a few times when people wanted me to help them install them. Um, and you know, the shipping for decoys and sound systems is pretty expensive. And right now flights are cheap, <laughs> but I've been to Bermuda to help install those. Um, let's see, where else have I gone? I, I mean, I worked on Devil Slide, so I did the systems there. Um, I feel like I've gone on other ones, but oh, Canada, I've gone to Canada, done some there. Yeah, not enough, but. <laughs> oh, it sounds great. It sounds great. This was a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much for telling us about the birds and their stories. The, uh, the Chinese birds very few, the population is really small. 
is there any concern about inbreeding? Well, I don't think anyone can worry about that yet. I, I guess there are occasions where they've interbred with the greater crested, um, but you know, I think they're just trying to build up the numbers, at least help the birds find one another. And maybe then they'd have to worry about some sort of inbreeding mitigation, but I don't think they're worried about that yet. I have a question from Amy. Is your shop unique or are there others in the world like yours? Uh, we um, are the only ones offering this recycled polyethylene plastic decoys. There's actually a guy not far away from here who does make wood conservation decoys, which are quite beautiful. So there, we have competition, <laughs> but not exact competition. And uh, do you ever need to make a new mold? Yeah, now they do deteriorate over time. It's this multiple layers of high temperature epoxy. So over time, we're probably gonna have to replace some of our common turn molds because we have four of those, but that's our most, um, we make the most of those. Um, and then we wanted to, it was a goal actually this year, but it might be not till next year to make a new species in our lineup. So. I was going to carve, we were thinking a red-footed booby might be the one to carve because uh, there is a project in Palmyra who might need some red-footed boobies. So to make the investment of making a new mold, it has to be something that would be <clears throat> in demand to some extent. So it seems like red-footed boobies might be the one. Uh, Jeffrey asks, how many tries does it take to get a decoy to work? <laughs> on the island? Uh, well, sometimes it takes years and sometimes it happens very quickly. It does seem in most cases that you need the decoys and the sound. You need to have proper habitat. Uh, you need to have food nearby, so intact habitat. And you need to have sound and the visual stimulation so they can hear it, they come by, they see the decoys, they stick, uh, but sometimes it takes years and years. You gotta be very patient. Uh, the decoys are for sale, are they not? Yes. And if one wants- Would you like one? <laughs> a decoy of a Northern Gannet, let's say, how would one go about- Yes. The uh, a few of them are available right in our online store. And in fact, you can order a paint your own decoy kit if you'd like a least turn size decoy that you want to paint in any species. Just tell us which species will provide you with the proper paint. <clears throat> um, and then if you want, if you're really doing a conservation project, so you'd want a number of decoys, uh, you get in touch through the store, but we give you a quote for the specific uh, amount because um, there's a price drop if you get a certain number of them. So I do have a, I do have one of the gannets, the Australasian gannets. How cute is that? They're pretty expensive, but they are quite big, rugged. Sometimes people buy these for their kids to play on, like kind of a little rocking horse kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> So you can get in touch through our website if you're interested in any decoys or sound equipment or mirror boxes. The mirror boxes we also produce here and they um, come apart. They're three-sided mirror boxes, very effective with turns especially. Uh, are there any other questions? All right, thank you, Sue. That was uh, fantastic. Um, okay, welcome. And, uh, encourage everybody this summer to uh, take.
take a trip up to Maine and uh, visit the shop. And uh, Hog Island is offering day trips this year, I believe. Yeah, so. actually our shop is probably going to be closed until the fall. But Hog Island has day trips yeah. and sessions at half capacity to follow COVID guidelines. And you can take a puffin boat trip um, on some of the commercial boats also and see Eastern Egg Rock. Now, when, when the puffin population is such that people can walk around the puffin colony, then you'll have it made. <laughs> They would love that. <laughs> Walking in a puffin colony. Yeah, it's true. So thank you again. And uh, uh, maybe you'll see some of our, uh, our uh, attendees tonight during the summer up in Maine. <laughs> nice. Very good. And re uh, as a reminder, next Wednesday, we've got um, Corey Folsom O'Keefe. Uh, with Share the Shore. So thanks everyone and uh, stay safe, get vaccinated. Take care. Yes, thank you. Sue, I will see you later this summer. Excellent. I'm gonna be up there